I think about the life I live, a figure made of clay. I think about the things I lost, things I gave away. And when I'm in a certain mood, I search the house and look. One day I found these magic words in a magic book. Throw it away, throw it away. Give your love, live your life each and every day. And keep your hand wide open, let the sun shine through. Cause you can never lose a thing if it belongs to you. Okay, this is Lucy Murphy uh, in October 2012. Lucy Murphy. Uh, Lucy. The, birth, the birthday of Dick Gregory. He's 80 years old. Wow. Today. Can you imagine? Hey, you know a lot. No, I just heard it on NPR this morning. 80 years old. Well, he's 80, and you're younger than that, so. I am. Where did you uh, grow up, Lucy, and tell us a little about uh, your early years. Okay, I grew up in Ward 1 before it was Ward 1 in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. My folks brought me home from Georgetown Hospital to um, a house uh, that they uh, rented a room from a nice lady on Georgia Avenue uh, right near Irving Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, went to uh, kindergarten, uh, well, we moved around a little bit, but uh, I went to kindergarten just a block from there uh, to Monroe School, uh, which was unfortunately uh, torn down recently um, and is now a park, but anyway. And what in your, um, you spent your whole life then in Washington, D.C., your hometown girl. Yes, right. yes. I have lived um, in Seattle for six months, and I visited other places, but uh, really I've lived, um, with the exception of the year in uh, Cuba, I've lived uh, my whole life here. What early experiences did you have that kind of put you in line for the social activism that you grew into? Um, I remember in the fifth grade, the boys could go out to play and the girls were supposed to stay inside and do something. And so I got a petition together and ha got all the girls to sign so that we could go outside too. And that worked? That It, wor it did work. Um, the teacher, uh, I don't know why we had this antiquated um, practice because our teacher, I later found out, had voted for Henry Wallace, you know, so she was quite progressive. Yes. Um, but it was a very, uh, D.C. is in many ways very Southern, very Christian. I remember my uh, teacher pulling out uh, scripture from the Bible to encourage me to be more industrious mm -hmm. in my um, uh, you know, she, she pulled out the passage about not throwing your talents away, you know, using what you have. Don't bury your talents. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. When did you start singing for justice? Um, singing for justice? Probably uh, at St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, we started going to, my mother and I started going to St. Stephen's um, in 61, I think. Uh, and um, we met Mother Scott. Uh, we met members, of course, a little bit later on, we met members of the Action Mass. But even then, um, St. Stephen's was incorporating uh, folk music uh, which included spirituals into the uh, the liturgy, and uh, uh, when Father Went, who was the pastor there, would lead a little group down to um, the city council or to some hearing, uh, he would often take Mother Scott uh, or one of us, and part of the testimony would be singing a song, you know, appropriate to the occasion. So, so uh, you were singing early yes. in church and on the street and at and, home too. And, 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 and at uh, the, um, 
the uh, St. Stephen's was kind of a, a revolutionary um, uh, place, and they had uh, uh, volunteers come from abroad every summer to uh, run a summer day camp. Um, and so we had volunteers from Britain and from Nigeria and other places uh, working with us. Um, yeah, but I, I, you know, I, I went to Banneker when it was a junior high school and my homeroom teacher was the secretary of the local core chapter. So she encouraged us to write letters to the editor about DC's colonial status. Uh, and that would have been like around 62 also. Mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, her name was Thorn Miss Thornton, Ruby M. Thornton. And uh, she would also lead picket lines uh, at some of the downtown stores that wouldn't hire black folks. Um, and we would join her on Saturday mornings for some of those picket lines. So that was that was early early '60s experience. So you were you were about 12 then, something like That's that. That's right. Right. Well, the, uh, then, do you remember anything? Uh, did you was did the sit-ins in 1960 and the Freedom Rides in 1961 have any impact on you? Were you able to? F well, we out? saw the dogs and the hoses on people in oh, on newscasts in yeah. the 50s. Yeah. Uh, so all of this stuff was, um, and my my brother was going to Howard University, and he remembers debates uh, at Howard, um, Malcolm X uh, debating. Um, was it A. Philip Randolph or yeah, uh, Port no? Port it, it was uh, it was the other fellow. Who, Bayard Rustin. Ba that's Bayard who. Rustin, Bayard right. Rustin. Right. Yes. Right. And what did they say about that? Uh, well, he was quite impressed with Malcolm X, and of course, the press was demonizing Malcolm X. And some of us didn't know any better than to believe what we what we read in the Washington Post. So I learned early on not to believe what you read in the Washington Post. Mm or that it is the suburban Washington Post. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump around a bit. Um, you graduated high school here in D.C. in 1968. What a year. Can you recall anything that your class at Wilson High did that year or, or felt that year? What was it like to be here in 68? Actually, um, that year at high school was anticlimactic for me because I had spent the previous summer in Puerto Rico. And that was my first experience being in a place where the people spoke a language other than English. Uh, and my first experience speaking Spanish, even though I had taken Spanish for um, a little while before then. Um, and, and it, before you get to, to that, there were more interesting things happening earlier. Um, the, uh, what, gosh, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, maybe I should d just address your question. Uh, I, of course, the assassination of Martin Luther King Mm -hmm. um, was um, a life-changing event. The city was put on lockdown. We, uh, I, I didn't realize how mild Washington was compared to some other places where it, if a similar thing happened, people would be shot. But there was a decision not to shoot um, so-called looters mm -hmm. or people who um, uh, were breaking um, glass, breaking the windows to the stores and, uh, and setting things on fire. Um, there was a decision not to shoot people. So it was probably um, a time when the uh, violence went down the most in the city. There was uh, fewer fights, uh, shootings, um, th there was a lot of stealing. And of course, I would walk down the street and someone would uh, offer me, would ask me what size I wore because they had a stockpile of things that they had taken from the local stores. 
Um, so, uh, and, and I thought that was really interesting. My brother, who had seen Malcolm X debate at, at Howard when he was attending this, said he had never seen black people so happy. Uh, it was, um, he had never, yeah. What did, uh, what did he mean by that precisely? Uh, just the, um, there was a, uh, um, of course, people were initially were shocked and very angry about uh, King's okay. assassination. But then the, um, uh, the looting, it, it became like a party atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. and, and people were very, um, uh, very friendly. You know, very and busy sharing the things that they had looted. Um, it was it was it was an interesting experience. I had never seen fire that big um, as I the fire the flames leaping from Seventh Street. Did you get downtown during any of that time, or was the curfew already on by the time that uh, uh, I well, you know, you could travel around certain hours of the day right. and certainly I saw yeah, um, yeah my, I, I think I probably drove around with my brother and looked at what was going on mm. um, so um, at that point uh, this would be spring and summer of 68 with all that happened did that make you feel frightened or hopeful or how, what were your feelings then as a young well, person um, political young person there, uh, the riots caused uh, such worry uh, in the government that all of a sudden all sorts of opportunities were made available. Such as? Uh, the, I, I remember um, Federal City College opened up. Um, perhaps it was going to open up anyway, but it seemed like it opened up with more of a flourish. Mm -hmm. uh, there were different job programs mm -hmm. and opportunities, uh, war on poverty and right. uh, so forth that were enhanced. Uh, so the, er, that time felt like um, there was going to be a new day. You know, we were going to have more possibilities. Uh, so there was a, an a atmosphere of hope. I remember, you know, I went to college mm -hmm. and I was able to go to college. Lucy, uh, what other what other events during the '60s when you were growing up do do you recall having had an impact on you, personal impact? Well, before we get to '68, um, the assassination of JFK uh, mm -hmm. was um, was traumatic. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, being a child. And uh, I, I would watch things on TV and actually believe what the newscast was telling me. So when they said that, you know, Nixon had more experience, I thought, oh, well, you know, then Nixon should be the president. And then I had my cousins, to, my older cousins, to straighten me out. They were teenagers and I was just a kid. Yeah. And they said, oh, no, you know, he's, he's a crook. And, uh, uh, and JFK is uh, really the, the guy that you should you know, and then then I observed um, uh, the the positive um, just the positive vibration that came in with his administration, uh, and uh, and so I was very much um, hurt, as were so many people in Washington D.C. by his assassination. Um, uh, but then uh, the, all of the programs that uh, were able to be enacted because of the sympathy, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the change sympathy in the Congress and the pushiness of uh, LBJ, Linda Mays Johnson, right. um, and Hubert Humphrey. Uh, and it seemed like those people were so much closer to us then. I remember going to a meeting where, you know, Hubert Humphrey was there. Uh, and he just walked in like a regular person with, with other leaders in the community. Uh, I remember um, um, Bobby Kennedy coming to Banneker Junior High School to speak to us and sitting on the same stage with uh, 
others of us who were supposedly, you know, school leaders. I think I was head of the safety patrol or something. Um, and uh, and the, the principal uh, slipped names of people in the school into Bobby Kennedy's speech. So he actually called my name, you know. I mean, what an experience for, uh, for a young person yeah. to hear the attorney general mention them as, you know, mm -hmm. being somebody worthwhile. Um, so that was, uh, uh, you know, that was part of, part of my experience. <sighs> the, uh, you know, we, you and I just went to uh, a memorial for a lady that I met around that time mm -hmm. uh, singing with a bunch of radical Catholics at an ecumenical uh, mass that mm -hmm. uh, I used to participate in called the Action Mass, which was led by civil rights attorneys and uh, public relations and news people who were active in the civil rights movement uh, and the uh, movement for justice and against poverty you know, at the time. Who are some of those people that you're talking about? Uh, uh, Landon Dowdy, mm -hmm. uh, attorney, uh, we called him Jack Dowdy in those days. Um, uh, Maggie Dunn's uh, husband, Matthew Clark, was involved in some sort of way, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, but people who were involved in UPO mm -hmm. um, were part of it. And uh, seminary, Catholic seminarians uh, who played the guitar, um, mm -hmm. who were... Um, at that time, churches were for helping poor people, and and it wasn't uh, there was no shame in being poor. A lot of people were poor, and it was a legitimate. You know, the poor people were poor for a reason, mm -hmm. um, not because they were shiftless and lazy. Uh, so there was a lot more sympathy for for helping people, and I think that was. Um, something that uh, really impressed me is that there were a lot of people who wanted to help somebody other than themselves. Uh, later we got into an era where people just wanted, seemed to want to boost themselves, promote themselves, and enrich themselves. But uh, that's, those weren't the leaders that I saw as a young person, as a teenager. There were a lot of people, I agree, in the 60s that were like that. Yes. It seemed like a, a lot of people. Yes. Well, after this kind of childhood and your own family's involvement and your own, your own uh, interesting life up to the time you were 18 or so, how, when did you, or, or how did you first get involved in social justice uh, work itself or with organizations? What, what did you find yourself doing after um, high school? It was really through cultural work. And uh, there wasn't um, a, uh, a big difference made between uh, politics and cultural work. Um, and it, and s the um, Father Went played quite a role in opening the doors of St. Stephen's for, uh, for coffee houses, for African dance groups. Uh, Melvin Deal had some of his first classes there. And of course, Melvin Deal is a wonderful uh, African dance researcher, choreographer, teacher, um, and he's been doing this for 50 some years. Um, and I remember his groups at St. Stephen's. Um, and, and of course, uh, being able to express one's culture is a political statement uh, because the the genocide that has happened in this country is about erasing people's cultural roots and cultural ties. Uh, and any, any effort to restore that, uh, to remind people of their African roots or their indigenous roots, which um, the, such a great uh, effort has been made to destroy, uh, any effort to change that is a political statement. Um, so that I, I saw that as a, as a young teenager. Uh, there, was, there were coffee houses there, and people would come through, and they would sing love songs, but they would also sing topical songs, mm -hmm. and songs that they had just written. Um, so that was a great, um, a great experience. I remember going to St. Stephen's once and hearing a, 
of some some folk singer, I can't remember who, but what were the other places that were around in D.C. in the 60s where you might hear that? Uh, well, of course, there was the cellar door mm -hmm. in Georgetown. Uh, and it seems like uh, art was more affordable. Uh, there were community theater groups and, and community theater spaces. Um, there were a lot of free art programs. Yeah. Tapa Karu had something, the right. new thing. New thing on uh, Over Street. on um, in Adams Morgan. Uh, there, um, Institute for Policy Studies mm -hmm. had the music carryout. Uh, which was a storefront um, on 18th Street near Florida Avenue. Talk uh, some more about that. That uh, mm -hmm. Ronnie Carpin uh, was one of the leaders uh, that kept the place going. She was a flute player before she became um, Orlando Latelier's assistant. And uh, she and a number of other uh, local activists, musicians, um, had uh, all kinds of jam sessions and classes and workshops there. Um, there was just a lot of, uh, uh, Susie Solf had the Everyday Theater, yeah. uh, which was using a Bertolt Brecht approach uh, to uh, having everyone who's involved in the theater group engaged in making decisions about the costumes, the dialogue, the scenery, uh, the action. And uh, that's about the time that there are stirrings of the women's movement in Washington too. Right? Also. What do you remember about that? You would have been pretty young still, probably I, 20. I was. I uh, remember Sophie's Parlor uh, the, uh, Sophie's Parlor Radio Collective at WGTB, uh -huh. um, which was the uh, radio station, the radical radio station in the basement of Georgetown University yeah. before they were kicked out by the um, <laughs> self-righteous uh, Roman Catholics, uh, who um, the church has really shown itself not to care very much about women or children. Uh, and at that point, uh, uh, but they were hiding out there and they, they seemed, well it wasn't hiding out because everybody could hear what they were doing, but somehow the people in charge there, I guess they never listened. So uh, uh, Sophie's Parlor uh, was a, a radical uh, collective of um, gay and straight, mostly white women, um, but who were certainly anti-racist um, and I knew them. I wasn't a part of the, I may have even been a guest on the program, but uh, at, at some point. Who would you say, in the, as you grew into young womanhood, your 20s, and who, who were your greatest influences? Or who were the people that you can think even now had a big influence on your political views and your growth? Um, my my seventh grade teacher, Miss Thornton, who who had us write those letters to the editor of the Washington Post. Um, there was was a teacher at uh, Cardoza, who rounded up uh, some of us that he thought were student leaders and got us uh, written up in the Washington Post. I think in '65. Um, uh, oh gosh, this is really bad. Um, <laughs> will, we'll have to insert his name yeah. in Jerry Schwinn. Jerry yes. Schwinn? Yeah. Uh, he was teaching at uh, Cardoza High School. And I was in the Cardoza area, even though I went to, I ended up going to Woodrow Wilson as a high school, but I went to the Feeder Junior High School for Cardoza, which was Banneker. And so I knew a lot of people at Cardoza, yeah. and, uh, and I met. Um, Jerry, because uh, St. Stephen's, well, there was something called the University Neighborhoods Council, uh -huh. which was Howard University School of Social Work, and the leaders of the progressive churches right. in this area around Howard University, which included All Souls, St. Stephen's, St. Paul and Augustine, which is now St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had a lot of different voluntary programs mm -hmm. uh, in their churches and uh, schools 
that um, people, they were for the community, uh, people in and out of the community participated as volunteers. Uh, Ruth Murphy, who, um, you know, some mothers might have disapproved of some of the activities and did disapprove of some yeah. uh, activities and kept kids at home. But uh, as long as I told her where I was going, she let me go. And sometimes she would come along with me. Uh, one of the times is when I went to um, the New School of Afro-American Thought, uh -huh. which was uh, started by some local people, but also folks who came to town with SNCC, right. uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, SNCC had an office on U Street and then the school, new school had a space on, one space on 14th, they ended up moving to another space. But anyway, they included a lot of historians um, and uh, poets. Uh, and there was a history class there and there were poetry readings. And my mom would uh, accompany me and, uh, and they would be so glad to see her because that was almost like a stamp of approval from an elder, yeah. um, you know, for my mom to come along. She really enjoyed it. Um, my mom uh, was uh, brown skinned. She wasn't what we would call dark, but she was in a family of very light skinned people and she felt discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And later when I found out about the brown paper bag parties mm -hmm. where you had to be a uh, brown paper bag or lighter in order to get in. I understood, uh, mm -hmm. you know, part of her uh, uh, support of me um, being active in mm -hmm. the civil rights movement and learning about my history because uh, she went to segregated schools where um, black history was more taught. In fact, she went to school with some of the people who were part of black history, like Charles Drew, yeah. uh, who was her, who had been her um, lifeguard at the pool. Uh -huh. um, uh, she was born in 1914, so she had seen quite a, quite a bit of history. And she would come along with me uh, to the new school of Afro-American thought, um, to a activities at St. Stephen's, um, and uh, uh, she, you know, she wanted me to continue in my studies. And so if I w would do my homework, I could get out of doing some of my household chores. Hmm. Yeah, which is, uh, so, so my mom definitely uh, in, in quiet ways had a great uh, influence on me. Um, how did your activism in the 60s and 70s uh, as a teenager and a young, and a young woman how, how, impact your own personal life? Uh, how, how, what would you say that? Mm. I know there was a lot of discussion, uh, particularly uh, women, uh, like uh, my mother was a housewife. And of course, uh, uh, women were demanding uh, more, uh, uh, that roles be open to them, jobs be open to them, that education. I remember when I first started at Georgetown, uh, the, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences was not open to women, mm -hmm. only modern languages and international studies. Right. Uh, so um, there was that uh, discussion of uh, balancing, um, particularly for women, balancing home or personal interests with uh, outside job, mm -hmm. um, political, uh, larger community uh, mm -hmm. interests. Um, I think I, I never doubted that I was supposed to go out in the world and um, uh, I, I don't think I ever thought that I was going to be a housewife. Yeah. Um, 
like my mom. Um, she had come along at a time that was uh, much more restricted. I mean, in many ways, she was a, a young person during the Depression. So even men didn't have jobs oh, yeah. uh, then and, and couldn't get, didn't have money to go to school. Um, but uh, now, um, hmm, that's an interesting question. The, uh, the, pers the personal and the political. Um, yeah. I always saw that, you know, life uh, is really a unity, that um, the divisions are kind of false. Um, so the personal, I never saw the personal as other than the political. So that's why it's hard to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, which commitments that you, political commitments, personal or political commitments that you've made in your adulthood, um, are you the most proud of? What are the things that you really are glad that you did as a, as a, as a young adult? As I um, watch some of the uh, icons of pop music destroy themselves or be destroyed by um, their lifestyle, right. um, their um, the insanity you know, kind of foisted on them by the pressures of that industry, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a greater appreciation for the fact that I didn't go there, that I, uh, I didn't get lured there. Um, uh, yeah. So you're glad about the path that you took using am, your voice for social justice? Service. I am glad about that. I, I haven't gotten very far, um, but I haven't uh, fallen into certain pits either. Mm -hmm. So. And you've been singing all these years? Yes. What's I have. your favorite song? And was? I can still sing. Well, let's hear your favorite song. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Sing us a song that you love to sing. It's, you know, it's hard to say a favorite song because there's so many favorites. But there is a song that um, I, I feel uh, needs a voice, mm -hmm. uh, which when I heard that uh, Amanata Moseka, also known as Abby Lincoln, uh, passed uh, a few years ago. I said, this is a song that I, I have to start singing because she's not here to sing it anymore. Okay. I think about the life I live, a figure made of clay. I think about the things I lost, things I gave away. And when I'm in a certain mood, I search the house and look. One day I found these magic words in a magic book throw it away throw it away give your love live your life each and every day and keep your hand wide open let the sun shine through cause you can never lose a thing if it belongs to you great song Well, winding this up, what are, your, what are your thoughts on social justice today to pass on to the next generation? Uh, I know you've been pretty continuously being an activist. Well, I'm very concerned about our community. Um, I'm very concerned about our humanity, about human beings, mm -hmm. um, our connections to each other. We are connected to each other. Uh, but um, many of us have lost that focus mm -hmm. through uh, being so worried about money and uh, position and uh, from paying the bills to status to um, we have uh, lost the practice of being concerned about each other. And even um, in families, uh, family members 
aren't concerned or don't demonstrate much concern about each other. Um, of course, I think some of this arises from parents having to work so hard and so many hours to put food on the table, to pay the mortgage or the rent. Uh, and so the relationship with the children uh, and with other uh, siblings is lost. And then the children seem to have more of a relationship to the TV or the computer or the telephone than to other people. And even though these are supposed to be means of relating to other people, uh, it becomes a, a means of relating to some illusion um, and not really to other people. And uh, I'm really concerned that we restore, uh, that we recognize our fears uh, and deal with them and restore the consciousness of, of our connection to each other. Um, and because without doing that, uh, we're not going to be able to do much of anything. This is really, I love that song. I thought and you were going to sing. Songs to sing. <laughs> yeah, the songs, are great, the songs are great. Well, Wait that's, in the Water is what I thought you were going to sing, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. we're all set. Well, I don't have the, I don't have the uh, audience to yeah, sing the chorus. Um, uh, I want to mention um, uh, the school that um, uh, that taught me was uh, the school of the community. Uh, the. Uh, St. Stephen's was a member of the University Neighborhoods Council mm -hmm. and the uh, one of the ladies who had a, a real impact on me uh, was the, I don't know if she was the executive director, but she was the lady in the office who was uh, studying in graduate studies at Howard University um, in the School of Social Work. Her name was Jessie Tellus Nyack and she was from India. And I had never seen anybody who could deal with everybody, young, old, black, white, angry, calm, and she never lost her cool. She was always calm and patient with people, and that really impressed me. Um, and I would come into the office and she would give me, uh, you know, those, put the paper clip on it, seal the envelope, you know, something that an 11 or 12 year old could do. Um, she would give me little tasks. Uh, so that was my um, first learning to uh, be a volunteer in the community, volunteering in an office, uh, doing, you know, simple clerical tasks. Um, because I could read and write and so I could do quite a few things and a lot of young people that age can do quite a few things and I feel like no one is asking them to do what they can do um, no one is really respecting uh, their intelligence and their ability and giving them the opportunity which Jesse Tellus Nyack gave me uh, there was another uh, lady who at the time was working in a halfway house. Uh, she was uh, one of the co-directors of Woodley House, which was one of the pioneering um, programs to have mental patients uh, work in, you know, in, in real life, out in the community, living in a halfway house, go to work or go to school and have some uh, supervision, some support um, mm -hmm. for their uh, mental or emotional illness. And that was uh, Edith Maeda, uh, Edie Maeda, who uh, helped to supervise um, a program, a volunteer program that I started under the umbrella of the University Neighborhoods Council, which we call Big Sisters and Big Brothers. I actually think it was Big Brothers and Big Sisters, um, in which I got some uh, volunteers, some college kids and some high school kids to volunteer and take uh, ki little kids in my neighborhood out for on Saturday, field trips mostly. But just having some, because uh, I saw a lot of the uh, younger kids in my neighborhood, I was an only child, but I saw most of the kids in my neighborhood um, were from large families and they weren't getting very much attention 
from their parents because either the parents were working or the parents didn't have much education and, and really didn't know that you could take your kid to the zoo or to the uh, museum downtown. We have a lot of free activities here in Washington, but people who had come up from the South really didn't know that these things were open to them because they come, came from a segregated South and things were just opening and folks weren't aware. Yeah. So um, I had uh, seminarians and college students and high school students uh, meeting at St. Stephen's with uh, some of the young people from an after school program that I worked in during the week. Uh, we would go out to some field trip um, uh, for the morning and afternoon on, on Saturday. Uh, for a couple of years, we did that. And Edie Maeta uh, supervised, because I was just a kid at that point, and mm -hmm. um, uh, she helped back me up. Uh, and it, it's so good to have an older person who has some experience uh, support a young person's initiative. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes young people take initiatives now, and nobody's even paying attention to know that, that they, yeah. to give them support, because they're busy focusing on something else. So that was, that, was the, that was my experience with the University Neighborhoods Council, which I, I'm sorry that uh, they no longer exist. Uh, I'd like to maybe see Howard University bring, bring that back into existence. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a teacher there who's no longer with us um, who um, had a, uh, she called them tutor warriors, uh, in which she recruited some Howard students to work with, work on reading skills with uh, uh, DC public school students, one-on-one -on -one kind of attention. Um, but, um, and I have to come up with her name too, because uh, she was uh, a very, um, very wonderful person, very wonderful example for people. One Do you mind if I ask a question? Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Uh, you talked about um, how you're really worried about society and humanity nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, could you be more specific about like what changes, what things have happened maybe after 1975 that made things worse or that made yeah. the situation worse? Um, mm. Maybe oh. locally or? Well, it, it, I mean, it happened before then. Um, is it camera running? Yeah. Oh, right. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, Waste, just wasting we, minutes okay. uh, here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, um, integration was a trick. Um, w you know, we thought that integration was going to be integration, right. that you were going to have black leaders and followers joining with white leaders and followers. And what you actually had was the elimination of a lot of black leadership in terms of business, in terms of teachers, school administrators. Uh, they were gotten rid of, and the students were put under a white administration. The black consumers were put under, uh, you know, the, uh, being served by white businesses. The black businesses were put out of business. Um, and uh, so, you know, what we, we need to revisit that. And, and uh, I look at so many of the so-called nonprofit organizations, uh, which is supposed to be progressive, and almost all the leadership is white. And here we are in Washington, D.C., with Howard University, uh, Bowie State nearby, Morgan State, uh, UDC. These are all historically black colleges and universities, and Trinity, which has a large uh, yeah. A black and brown population, and of course, women's leadership. Uh, these institutions are ignored when we recruit mm -hmm. for um, for our nonprofit and progressive. So I go to uh, what is it? Uh, it used to be Co-op America. Now it's Green America, mm -hmm. and all of the speakers and presenters on the program, which is supposed to be talking about sustainable energy and, um, and ecology, in Washington, D.C., all of the presenters are white. 
and I look at the people running the departments and the few people I knew who were black in co-op America are no longer there. Mm -hmm. And you know, how, how do we, how do we, how can we be conscious and uh, say we're conscious and continue uh, with this um, invisibilization of black talent, brown talent. I think about that with the, uh, the Negro Leagues in baseball, actually, because uh, integration in Jackie Robinson was, was a big, big deal right. um, when they came in. But at the, at the same time, uh, the Negro Leagues were, I think, the largest black-owned business in the world at yes. the time. Uh, yes. And that disappeared, you know, in yes. the late 40s, early 50s. And it wasn't just the yeah. teams, but yeah. all the businesses that yeah. were supported yeah. yes. by it the teams. Yeah. Um, it was a whole ecosystem, yes. exactly. Yeah. And we can see an ecosystem like that with our Latin American uh, brothers and sisters that have soccer games, mm -hmm. which they call football, yeah. on the weekends, and all the ladies who pre prepare the food that they bring out and sell, and other items that are brought out for sale. I mean, it's a whole, it's a community industry. Um, and yes, when you uh, have certain kinds of integration, it's not real integration, it's... Um, Usurpation. 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 Right. right. Yes. I'll go ahead and I'll stop. And we're we're all set. We're recording. Oh. Yeah. Okay. 1963, late August, um, the March on Washington, uh, led by Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders, St. Stephen's Church congregation marched down from the church down 16th Street to join. Uh, the March on Washington, and I was 12, almost 13 uh, at that point. And uh, I remember uh, during my, uh, the lunch hour, uh, my father and one of the owners of the department store where he worked uh, joined the, um, uh, the march too. I didn't know that because it was huge and they were in another section but I was with uh, the congregation of St. Stephen's uh, underneath the trees by the reflecting pool uh, listening to Peter Paul and Mary and Odetta and all Freedom the singers. other people who, yes, who sang that day. Um, and the other, uh, uh, oh, um, after Martin Luther King's assassination, uh, Resurrection City which was uh, the people's, the poor people's march uh, to all people all across the country came to Washington, D.C. Uh, to demonstrate for uh, justice and opportunities for, for poor people uh, in this country. And uh, I remember the members of the Action Mass uh, going down to Resurrection City. It was a h horrible, muddy, messy, Place, but it was an amazing gathering of um, of people, and uh, it, I may have met uh, Frederick Douglass Kirkpatrick uh, at that point. I know I certainly met him later on because we were among the few people uh, to support the Palestinians mm -hmm. and to receive the slings and arrows yeah. of the folks who claimed we were anti-Semitic mm -hmm. uh, and anti-Israel because uh, we were acknowledging the human rights of the Palestinian people. Um, this would have been 1968. Yes, right. 1968. Um, Can you talk more about Resurrection City? Um, that's it. Well, I remember that the so-called leaders stayed in a motel up on 15th Street, right. Pitts, Pitts Motor Hotel. They did not stay down in the mud. Right. Um, the real sincere people were down in the mud. Um, but uh, the, the other folks, and I won't mention their names, but they, they thought they were following in the footsteps of Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther King would have been in the mud. Right. He would not have been at Pitts Motor Hotel. Um, he was a, a, a really sincere uh, uh, person who, who, ne who was never out f 
for um, the, 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 the fried chicken or the Cadillac that so many of our uh, Baptist ministers uh, want to go after. <laughs> yeah. Um, later on, I was um, uh, called in uh, after the assassination of uh, Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carp and Moffitt, uh, I remember um, being called to do memorials and programs uh, to, to remember them, uh, to remember the coup in Chile, uh, to call people's attention to the war in Central America, uh, no draft, no war, U.S. out of El Salvador. Um, uh, I um, got my fiance uh, a, 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 an, a, an appointment with a psychiatrist so that he could get a diagnosis of being a hysterical neurotic and uh, an appointment with an orthopedic specialist who pointed out some deficiencies in his, um, in some uh, shoulder or knee rotations. And when he took those to the draft board, uh, he got uh, an unfavorable, um, uh, and, and that was because uh, again, I attended St. Stephen's Church where there were draft counselors who told us what to do to stay out of Vietnam. Um, because in uh, 1968, uh, the Vietnam War was still going on and we were t still trying to, uh, to get, to stop that and to keep people from going. Um, yeah. So that was, yeah, one of my 1968 activities. Um, I remember uh, when the war did end, I went, I was invited to New York to a celebration. In the Sheep Meadow. And it was, um, actually this was an indoor celebration. And it was uh, broadcast on Hanoi radio. And uh, there was, a publication here, uh, maybe the State Department, Foreign Broadcast Information Fibus, Report. Fibus, right. Uh, right. And a friend of mine used to read those mm -hmm. and found out that I had been up in New York <laughs> celebrating um, the end of the, of the Vietnam War. Um, so that was uh, something else I remember. Yes. Good. Thank you, Lucy Murphy. Mm -hmm.